Together, we are making giant leaps to end cancer as we know it. During our program, you will hear from NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, Department of Health and Human Services, Secretary Javier Becerra, as well as Director of the National Cancer Institute, Dr. Cameron Rathmel, and NASA astronaut Frank Rubio, NASA astronaut Steve Bowen. I'd also like to recognize in the audience with us, Dr. Lisa Carnell, Division Director of NASA's Biological and Physical Sciences Division, Dr. Katrina Jamison, Director of the Sanford Stem Cell Institute, who has pioneered stem cell research in space. And I'd also like to welcome members of the Cancer Moonshot team from our White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Now I'll turn it over to Administrator Nelson. So this is uh, personal to me because 38 years ago, when the administrator of NASA, Jim Beggs, decided that uh, in the early part of the space shuttle program that NASA was going to uh, fly, train and fly, the chairman in the Senate and the chairman in the House as a payload specialist. And I had just been elected as chairman of the space and science subcommittee in the house. And in the formal letter of uh, invitation, he said that I want you to decide the experiments that you're going to do on orbit. It just so happened that in my capacity as chairman, I was at the Marshall Space Flight, Flight Center in a tour and a briefing. And out of the blue, one of the people said, and by the way, I knew that I was going to fly, but it had not been announced publicly. So out of the blue, this fella is telling me there is this promising experiment down in Birmingham at the University of Alabama at Birmingham Medical School on protein crystal growth, but they had not been able to get a crew member to dedicate the time to do the experiment. It just so happened that just a few months earlier, I had lost a girl that was like a sister to me to breast cancer. So I was highly sensitized. And when I heard that, I knew that that was the experiment, the primary one. I ended up doing 12 ex medical experiments, but that was my primary experiment. Uh, this is me. It's a rather crude thing. What they do today is automated, Mine, obviously, was done by hand. Uh, you can see it's much more sophisticated today. Uh, this was a rack that I had to pull in and out. It had no vibration control. There was no temperature control. Very, very crude. But you ought to see this, although not the crystals that I grew, they're even more dramatic than this you can see crystals grown in one gravity on Earth and crystals grown in microgravity on orbit. And so what these guys have done is they do this experimentation while they are on orbit for six months. In the case of Frank, bless his heart, he was there for a year and they're starting to have dramatic results. So take, for example, protein crystal growth, which allows you to grow a larger and to use my unsophisticated terms, more pure or ultra pure crystal, which allows you then to better understand its complex makeup in the molecular structure 
which allows you to then manipulate it uh, to do what you want to do in cancer research. And, and one of the things that they are doing, uh, for example, the drug Keytruda. Keytruda is this phenomenally successful drug against several types of cancer. As a matter of fact, remember, uh, President Carter had been given like two or three months to live and uh, he was administered Keytruda. He is still alive. This was two or three years ago. Uh, well, what they've discovered by being able to analyze the drug, they can make it in more pure form by what they've learned on analyzing the drug in microgravity. And as a result, a patient does, doesn't have to do the painful and often very lengthy IVs in the hospital, but can do it in a doctor's office with a shot. That's just one example. Another example, they can determine with this crystallization, they can determine the markers that they can attach to a cancer cell, which enables the drug to get to that cancer cell and not kill all the surrounding tissue. That's just one thing. Another thing, stem cells. You think about it, millions and millions of stem cells. And we grow them on Earth and they, again, this is my unsophisticated analysis uh, and explanation. They all, because of gravity, clump together. And a lot of them die. You take them to microgravity and they're suspended. And these um, organoids that the doctor has been educating the three of us about uh, earlier this morning, uh, they can grow these mini organs, an organoid, and therefore they can experiment in microgravity on a drug's effect on an organ instead of having to do this on the whole organ on our earth. Now, this is just the beginning. So indeed, we are very privileged at NASA to be a part of the Cancer Moonshot Cabinet. And I think because of the work of folks like this, uh, that you're gonna see increasingly breakthroughs that are going to very much revolutionize medical uh, advances with regard to cancer. Final thing I'm going to tell you, uh, we lost my friend who was like my sister to breast cancer, but her two children are my godchildren. And I am going to be calling them and telling them about these advances in research. Thank you. I now I'd like to welcome up Secretary Becerra. Administrator Nelson, great to be with you here with all the team. Um, I'm just an attorney, so I'm going to get answered real quickly because I, I'm in between scientists and astronauts and those who are really doing the work on uh, cancer discovery and cure. And I think it's fantastic that you see this partnership that has to occur for it to happen. Uh, at HHS, we take very seriously the president's words that we must change the way we look at cancer and that we have the capacity to truly save lives. And so at HHS, we want to be able to launch the NASA in this effort, the president's effort that in cancer moonshot. And I think we look at this as a reality. So when you take a look at astronauts like uh, astronaut Bowen and Rubio and the work that they have done already, 
and the future astronauts will go up. And uh, I think Dr. Jameson was thrilling us with the work that she is doing in at UC San Diego that could help us bring those cures for cancer far faster. And when you can accelerate by 10x the opportunities to discover where, the, where we need to go, that's a phenomenal thing. At HHS, we recognize that to get that rocket up in space, you need some fuel. And as the president has, has recently announced in his budget, we are putting close to $3 billion into the cancer moonshot because we believe in this fiscal year of 2025 coming up, we can make a real difference, but you need the fuel. And we intend to go up into space to make those discoveries because Dr. Jameson can't wait another 10 years. And so I hope that with uh, the courage of our astronauts who are going up and helping us make these discoveries, that we will be able to make a phenomenal change in the lives of people really soon. At HHS, and here is where I have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Kimberly Brackmill, who is our top dog when it comes to science and how we do cures in cancer at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, I will tell you that her team is going to be working with Administrator Nelson's team and so many others across the nation to make sure that we get to the moon when it comes to cancer. And so I am thrilled that this partnership, speared by someone who personally is dedicated to make this happen, President Joe Biden, that we're going to have these opportunities. And I'm hoping, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, that our, our buddies down the street in Congress will have the good sense to support the funding requests that we have made on behalf of NASA, on behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services, and so many of the agencies that will work with the experts like Dr. Jameson to make this happen. And so uh, with no further ado, I wish to uh, present to you and have the real expert on the issues of cancer and bringing us the cures to cancer, our, our leader of our team, Dr. Kimberly Bradman. Great, thank you very much. It, it is a real thrill to be here. Um, just, just a huge honor and uh, to get to talk to you all. Cancer is a big problem. Everyone knows and has been touched by cancer. Almost 2 million people this year will be diagnosed with cancer in the United States. 600,000 will die. In spite of those in, incredible numbers and 20 million people uh, with a diagnosis of cancer, um, we've made remarkable gains. and. Death rates are declining and five-year survival is increasing. And, that, and that's all because of research. Um, the impact of the National Cancer Program and the National Cancer Plan and the Biden moonshot is to say that everyone plays a role in, in the efforts for cancer and that we all work together. And so this is a tremendous partnership. So I'm, uh, I'm really proud to be here and to think about the all of government approach of, of the moonshot, which is so important and really highlights the, the incredible work um, that, that we do together. I can't underestimate one, I'm gonna say just how excited I am to be here. So I didn't totally introduce myself because I'm a medical oncologist. I see patients with cancer. I've been a healthcare administrator. I uh, came from being a chairman of medicine. I run a laboratory. My PhD is in biophysics. And so I am feeling really like a, a little bit of my geek on here um, to be at NASA. And I, I also wanted to tell you that, you know, how did I get to do those kinds of things is that, you know, uh, in 1982, I was one of the kids who applied to space camp and the um, ability of space to capture the imagination is huge for everyone. And it, it is meaningful, even for those of us who grow up and become cancer biologists. And so, um, you know, when I was thinking about what uh, the impacts are of the collaborations with NASA, it's tremendous. There are certainly things that are in the technology space. And I, and I thought, um, you know, sort of immediately of things like, um, like the Boltzmann transport equation, I thought it, um, uh, which is not what we're gonna talk about today, but, but, that, but that is, we, we couldn't treat patients with the linear accelerators that we do in radiation biology every single day without technology that is adapted from what you do in space. We also use the language of space to talk about the frontiers of cancer and the ways that we now look at cancers with increasing granularity down at cellular um, 
multicellular and then atomic and molecular levels. And that's, that, that is literally because of uh, Im impacts of the space program. But specifically to the kinds of experiments that take place in microgravity, you, you've heard already some of them, which are making major advances. Dr. Jameson is a, is a huge um, uh, uh, advocate and a, uh, uh, example of how rapid advances can happen. You already heard about uh, taking a drug, so antibodies and increasingly antibodies are being used to uh, develop our immunotherapies. They're complex, large molecules. More and more drugs are antibody-based. They have to be given as an infusion, as you heard uh, from Administrator Nelson, every month, some of these, for the rest of a patient's life. But if it could be formulated in a way that could be administered as a shot, it would be a game changer. And that is something that can only happen because of uh, the uh, insights that come from microgravity uh, crystallization. So for drug formulation. But just for understanding these, these molecules, that's where the, these crystal opportunities really have tremendous advances. You saw the picture of, of, a, of a, uh, what looks like a prism type crystal they're very highly ordered, but deep in there is looking at the space of a protein. And proteins interact in multiple different kinds of ways and getting an insight into where there's a crevice, where a drug can get in, is where having a perfect crystal can really help you. A perfect crystal can also help you understand how a mutation has changed everything and made it so that proteins are interacting in a different way and can give you incredibly different insights. This is, these are proteins that interact very dynamically, and so understanding how a different condition might make them be different, or how, the, how it works differently in other ways. So where these crystals help us just understand the processes that we couldn't in any other way. In terms of the drug development, I'll give a, another example as well. So RAS is a, the name of a commonly mutated gene, the most commonly mutated gene in, in solid tumors. Uh, one that we've really been focused on for decades, because if you could target RAS, you could impact so many cancers. And it wasn't until we had good crystals that we could see where and how to target RAS that the first drugs came out, which are just on the, just coming out this year. So the, the tremendous advances, I just can't even underestimate. And so I want to thank you all um, for all of the work that you do. I think we have so much to learn. Um, I'm really looking forward to doing more uh, with, with the NASA program. I wanna thank you all so much and looking forward to the continued analogies of the frontiers and also how to capture the imagination. So thank you very much. I wanna thank each of you for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, and in case you haven't noticed, we have some of our greatest ambassadors up here, our astronauts, and today we'll hear from two of them. Uh, they've all conducted groundbreaking research in space to help fight cancer on Earth. But first, we'll hear from uh, astronaut Frank Rubio, who returned to Earth last September after spending a record-breaking 371 days in space, the longest single space flight by U.S. astronaut in history. Then we'll hear from astronaut Steve Bowen, who most recently served as a flight engineer on Expedition 69 to the International Space Station. Frank? All right, thank you very much, Administrator Nelson, Secretary Becerra, Dr. Rathbone. Uh, thank you so much. And ma'am, we are all happy to nerd out with you, especially when it comes to science and medicine. Uh, I think we were all getting excited just uh, hearing you talk. Uh, but what an honor it is to be an ambassador for the NASA team. And I think NASA represents that uh, is symbolic, that when our nation puts our mind to doing hard things, we come together and we, we absolutely achieve them. And so the fact that, uh, as you, you all well said, cancer touches all of our lives because we all have loved ones who have been affected by that. And so knowing that NASA is now going to be part of this effort is really an incredible honor. And, um, you know, we not only get to be researchers and scientists, but the reality is we also get to be a part of the testing because there is uh, such a unique environment in space, both because of microgravity and radiation, obviously. Um, the equivalent of about a thousand chest x-rays is what we're exposed to when you're in uh, space for about six months. Uh, and so for a year, it's probably a little bit more than that. 
Uh, and there's only been, uh, so far, you know, one person who's been up there for a year, but there's been four of us who've been up there for close to a year, and I'm confident that many more will spend more time, especially as we endeavor to go back to the moon and onward to Mars. This is something that we absolutely have to do. And so uh, this, this effort is uh, uniquely uh, personal to all of us as an astronaut corps. Um, and the reality, again, is that it's an honor to represent both NASA and our country. Uh, yes, microgravity uh, and space uh, actually provides a very unique environment where biological processes tend to accelerate. Uh, not only uh, things like cancer cells or stem cells, but actually the aging process, uh, unfortunately for all of us. Uh, the, uh, the, the things we see like bone density loss, muscle density loss, immunological changes, cardiopulmonary output changes, uh, those all tend to mimic aging. Uh, but the beauty of it is what we figured out is that we can reverse a lot of those changes when we come back and by putting uh, the proper measures in place. And so what astronauts used to lose up to 20% of our bone density uh, for long duration flights, now we're losing less than 5%. Uh, and it's because of those measures that we've put in place and putting in the work. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I think this is a problem that we will absolutely help to solve and uh, we're, we're honored to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you. Now I'll welcome up Steve Bowen. Good morning, everybody. Administrator, Secretary, Target. Um, it's really exciting to be up here today to, to be a part of the Cancer Moonshot. I, I kind of have to digress a little bit. This summer, I, I called a friend of mine on his birthday in July uh, to wish him a happy birthday. Um, just after Christmas, he had a relapse. And two weeks ago, a month ago, I came up to see him, and things seemed to be getting better. Uh, a week and a half ago, I was here at first year. So, um, you know, this stuff really touches home, uh, whether it be parents, you know, friends, family. It's, it's a real, real issue, obviously, going forward. And there have been initiatives through the decades and uh, to, to really focus on cancer and working hard to find those solutions and having the opportunity to do research in space. 38 years seems like a long time because that's basically Woody's age. And, but, you know, that is the incredible thing that we do at NASA. You know, we do this research uh, and it continues. And everything we learn along the way. Uh, when I first started going to Space Station, there was a crew of three. And they had to spend an incredible amount of time maintaining and operating that station alone. The amount of time that we had to focus on research in particular was, was a, a lot more limited. And the capabilities of the vehicle were a lot more limited. But now, with a crew of seven, four USOS astronauts at any given time, the research we're able to undergo and conduct on orbit is exponentially increased, plus the automation that we now have. I, uh, I've been around a while, so I helped build the space station, and I kind of joke. So we had VTRs. You all know what video tape recorders? No, some of these people don't remember video tape recorders. But you know, that was a ba major way of collecting data. And the ability to get real-time data and real results uh, from Space Station now is absolutely incredible. There was one, it was a Saturday afternoon, Sultan was working an a, a experiment called Cardinal Heart. And we could all hear the chatter over the, the comms. And uh, that, that heart cell uh, started beating. And it, it was, you could hear the excitement in the primary investigator's words. It, it was just incredible to be part of that science and research. And that's something that I don't think uh, everybody gathers. And so I'm gonna mention 38 years ago, not to say how long ago that was, but you know, it really tells you that the basic research that we do on space station, in space, that we've been doing for 20, more than 24 years on board space, or more than 23 years on board space station, but really for over half a century in space, uh, the impact that has and continuing that as we go forward, uh, whether it be on space station for at least another six years or onto other vehicles and the rate of what we can do in space with our communication systems and the dedication of you know, at fellow astronauts able to help work those experiments is absolutely incredible. So I'm incredibly excited to help represent the Cancer Moonshot for obviously a number of reasons, but the excitement that it will bring the 
research opportunities and focusing uh, what we have learned on the ground and in space and continuing to learn those things. It's not going to get lost. It's going to get better. And uh, I want to thank you all very much for your time. Thank you all so much. Um, we do have some members of uh, the media in the back of the room. Um, so I'd like to invite our participants up here and then I'll ask you guys a couple of questions. Um, ask that you please keep your questions related to transformation of the topic of today's program. Um, well, he's going to hand you a mic for the rest of those questions. <laughs> Within a decade of President Kennedy's famous moonshot speech, Americans were on the moon. How far are we from President Biden's goal of ending cancer as we know? Are we years? Are we a decade? Okay. Yeah. That's for me. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see how to answer that question. So we're ending cancer as we know it every day. So I'll, I'll start there. So. When I think about what does it mean to end cancer as we know it, that, that's actually the harder of the two goals, by the way. It's ending cancer as we know it and reducing the death rate by 50% in 2030. So uh, that one, I, I think that we can do. The, the curve is already declined toward that. We make that curve go a little bit faster and we'll get there. So um, cancer is, number one, um, knowing it is taking all the parts of that from cancer. We need to work on prevention and people owning a piece of how to avoid ever having a cancer or detecting it early and managing it much more effectively. That would be a part of any cancer as we know it. Any cancer as we know will also be the kinds of treatments that we're talking about that take you to a space where you go to the doctor, you've got a diagnosis with cancer, they have a treatment algorithm, you go through it and you're done and, and your cancer is cured. That is true today for so many more cancers than it ever was. And so getting it to a place where people have that experience as the expectation rather than something that they're not aware is even possible, that will be ending cancer as we know it. And taking away the fear so that people don't do the prevention and the early detection and, and the management of the cancers that they have. That's part of ending cancer as we know it. So, so I do think that that's happening. And it is really inspiring to me to go and talk to people and say, you know, what's your family's experience with cancer? And they say, oh, my mother had breast cancer, but it was not. That's exactly what I want you to say. Like, that's what I want cancer to be. Now, we all have, I, I lost my mother to cancer this year. Um, I know that uh, we are not there yet. We don't have a cure for all the cancers, but we are one by one um, knocking them off. And then the other, um, sorry, I'm taking a long time to answer this question. The other thing, as I've been giving the moonshot um, uh, analogy, you know, you, you all are, are already thinking well beyond the moon to other, other places that you're going to go. And when I think about cancer, and cancer is not one disease, cancer is a thousand different diseases. And tackling each one takes things that we learned from the first, but also we have to learn lots of new things as we go. And so the cancer moonshot for us is a little bit like telling us we're going to get to Mars and, and maybe five other planets that all have a little bit of a different um, angle to them. And, and, and that's all right. We're up to that challenge. So um, so that's what it's going to be to, to end cancer. So timeline, um, a little bit every day. Uh, any other questions? Thank you for Secretary in Spanish, if it's possible. Si nos puede decir cuál es la importancia de esta investigación para nuestra comunidad hispana, que es una de las estadísticas que está siendo afectada. Creo que todos sabemos que en cualquier momento la noticia nos puede llegar que somos nosotros los que tenemos el cáncer. Y todos queremos saber que hay un modo de salir de ese pésame. Así que lo que hacemos hoy es tratar de ayudar a cualquier persona en este país o en el mundo que necesita un tratamiento. Y ojalá pronto vamos a poder decirle a esa familia que escucha la palabra que alguien en la familia tiene cáncer, que es, tiene cáncer, pero lo podemos curar. Y ahí está lo, lo que importa aquí es poder curar la esperanza. Y el, lo que hablamos aquí es de la, de la esperanza. 
Transitive. Transitive. <laughs> uh, no more questions? I've never seen the press so tame. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> all right, well, if nothing else, I think that's all the time that we have for today. I want to thank you all so much for joining us as we continue to make Moonshot after Moonshot. Thanks so much and have a great day.